attackers are only getting more proficient, so how can you proactively adapt your cybersecurity strategy? Core Security by Fortra helps you uncover and prioritize the risks that pose the biggest threat to your organization. Core Impact is a penetration testing tool that safely finds and exploits vulnerabilities using the same techniques as attackers. You can conduct advanced pen tests with ease using certified exploits and automations. Take your engagements even further by pairing with our additional red teaming tools from Cobalt Strike and Outflank. Learn more at securityweekly.com forward slash Fortra Core Security. Created in 2005 and hosted by security industry veterans, Paul Security Weekly is your source for in-depth coverage of the latest vulnerabilities, exploits, and security research. Our weekly security news discussion dives deep into the security issues we face today and potential solutions in a fun and lively atmosphere. Each week we bring on guests from the security community to learn about their journey and discuss topics relevant to their work and research. You can also subscribe to our show by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe or look for Paul Security Weekly in your favorite podcast catcher. We've recorded a ton of content over the years, so we created Spotify playlists featuring some of our favorite episodes, including interviews with Marcus Random, John McAfee, and Chris Roberts, to name a few. You can find them at securityweekly.com forward slash starter packs. Welcome to RSA Conference 2023. We're here recording live from Broadcast Alley in Moscone West. Uh, this interview was sponsored by VMware Carbon Black. I'm your host, Adrian Sanabria, and joining me for this interview is Jason Rolleston, G VP and GM of VMware Carbon Black. Yep. And uh, welcome, Jason. Good to, good to have you here. Yeah, thanks to have you. Great to be here. It's, uh, it's been an exciting week. And uh, yeah, good conversation here. This is, this is one of my favorite uh, topics to, to talk about. But uh, let, let's start off with uh, what CISOs are focused on. Yeah, you know, right I, I was uh, I was trying to think of, like what's new and different, and I think uh, there's just, there's almost what's uh, what's old is new again. I feel like the the cloud has definitely come up and, and is picking up more cloud security, container security, modern apps. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of it, I think, is basics. It's uh, continuing to be focused on detection, uh, response, uh, a lot about how to get the most out of your teams and most out of your investment. So it's um, in many ways, you know, staying focused. I think we we tend to gravitate to the new and the shiny, but a lot of what the CISOs are the same stuff. Manage risk, get stuff done. You know. Yeah, we call them basics, but they're not easy. No, that's no, the thing. No, that's no, the problem. Not. No, yeah. not at all. Right. Yeah. So, so what are some of these things that you're hearing from CISOs that that they're really focused on these problems? You know, especially with the the market currently. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of companies have had layoffs. Yeah. Uh, so clearly, they're they're dealing with uh, talent acquisition yeah. and, and retention, things like that. What what yeah. other things? Yeah. I mean, look, I think there's the there's there's budget pressure that I'm hearing out of people I haven't heard in a while. It's not necessarily now. Sometimes it's future. They're expecting pressure. Um, you know, certainly uh, continue to manage the team and talent. Talent's always a challenge in this stuff. And then I think how you how you help that talent do the most. I mean, it starts to get across to, to the experience and the tools they're given. Make like, sure they're effective and efficient. Yeah. yeah, how can you get as much out of them and make sure their time's not being wasted on kind of rude and routine things and uh, you know, free yourself up to take on some of the new, the new risks, the new challenges. People are facing uh, much more advanced attacks. I mean, I think one of the things we've seen with the rise of, of ransomware not just being a, an event at the end when you encrypt, it's really the last thing they do. It's the whole attack up to then, the double extortion. Yeah. Um, people who haven't faced advanced attacks are yeah. now having to deal with advanced attacks, and that's putting some new uh, some new requirements into their, their space. So. Well, and again, talking about basics, uh, a lot of people can't detect the basic things. No. You know, when I look at a ransomware, uh, you know, how ransomware goes down, it looks like a pretty typical pen test that we've yeah. been having for, for 20 years, yeah. you know, up until that, uh, you know, the ransomware payload step. Yep. Which uh, is very modular and can change, so it's it's yep. it's hard to prepare for that. But really, those 17 steps before the ransomware, yep. why aren't we detecting that? You know, look, I think a lot of organizations just didn't have to worry about this kind of threat. I mean, yeah. if you think about a lot of it was the security through obscurity. There was no reason to go at some of these smaller shops or these different places. So right. um, they could get away with basics, the AV, some of these things, and say, look, I'm, I'm good enough. I'm not worried about virus. I'll go okay. But I think the... The economic incentive, right? The economic driver for ransomware now bringing these more sophisticated attacks yeah. down to everybody is is kind of, you've got to do more. People got to look inside, and then you you get the zero trust mentality. People are generally inside somewhere. Mm -hmm. How do you find them? How do you identify them? That's a big part of what we have been focusing on with our efforts. Really, this idea of how you identify lateral movement and find those folks who are already inside. Yeah, and it, you know, it used to be, you know, the excuse used to be, we don't have PII, we don't have payment data, like we, we don't have anything yeah. attackers would want. 
And even back in the day, we would see cases where people would come in BC style scams, you know, yep. 10, 15 years ago. Uh, we'd ask people, "Do you have money in the bank?" Yeah. <laughs> Ultimately, yeah. that's what the that's what they're after. Yeah. And they, and they prefer that to having to, you know, buy iPhones with a stolen credit yeah. card and, and have to launder and fence that uh, way simpler and tumble tumble all that uh, you know that data. No, no, way simpler, cleaner, cleaner way to get the money out for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so obviously, you know, CISOs, uh, one of the primary roles is to reduce risk. Yep. You know, but they need these staffs, uh, you know, detection and response yep. is, is, is still very human dependent. You know, I, I think, uh, I'm sure you've had a thousand conversations about chat GPT and how, <laughs> how it can, you know, maybe yep. increase some of the automation here, increase that efficiency yep. and that efficacy per, per, per head count maybe. And, and maybe we'll see that in the near years. But, but for now still have to attract and acquire talent. Yeah, I think you do. I think you um, you also have to find ways to make the tools, the technology approachable to that talent. And, and you find ways to have um, more and more of the work that's manual, that's heavy lift, uh, done by tech, mm -hmm. right? So what can we do to see more, uh, stop more attacks, uh, provide the information to you in ways that you can consume, and, and really help that process along, right? Because yeah. you, you're only going to have so many people in the end. So again, how do you get the most out of them? And we still have a gap between you know, the time that the attackers need to, yeah. get, to get what they want and to uh, get to their goal versus us detecting them and having an opportunity to contain, yeah. eradicate, uh, get them out of the environment. So, so that's, uh, what is that gap like nowadays? Is it still measured in days? Um, it depends who you ask. There are organizations yeah. who will tell you they, they got it in minutes and this, that, and the other. But I think, look, it's um, it, some things you're getting quick. I, I always think of these threats across the, the spectrum. There's a certain set of things you detect in seconds. There are things mm -hmm. you detect in, in minutes and hours. And there are things that you detect in days and weeks and months. Yeah. Um, averages are, yeah, and I think probably in the days is, is probably what you would see across the, uh, the company. And you have to have some response. Like detecting is yeah. only half the battle. Yeah. Yeah, without, uh, you know, if your response capability is entirely manual, you know, that that's maybe not going to help you. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, look, I think um, finding stuff fast is a matter. It's, it's part of why, you know, all the hubbub around XDR and this and that of, of how we get better at detecting, identify it. I think R gets overlooked in some cases. Yeah. Uh, it's a big part of it. It's how do I actually go through and, and investigate more rapidly? Yeah. Uh, and then what can I do about it to, to start hiving off and, and protecting myself and remediating? Uh, the whole picture matters. Uh, it's a big thing we've been able to do. I think some really strong at, at, at Carbon Black for a long time is, is provide that whole mix. And a big part of what VMware uh, kind of brings to the table is all these remediation options and working with the network, taking a lot of different steps to, to kind of secure the environment when, uh, when you're finding yourself in trouble. And speaking of XDR, uh, I hear you have a new product. We do, we do. Um, you know, in some ways, uh, people are like, uh, you're late in, late in space. I think if you're an EDR player, you have to be there. Um, we really wanted to do something thoughtful and, and, and kind of do it right. We do. So we, we um, XDR, uh, I think as you well know, really loosely defined space. Yes. <laughs> Not yeah, well we, understood. And we need to uh, cover that because yeah. uh, people are going to be like, oh, yeah, <laughs> you know. What, well, what, what do you mean? What do you yeah. mean when you say XDR? And it's funny is I find myself as a real believer in XDR, but a lot of times with customers, I actually say it and then run away from it. And, and yeah. I say that because there's so much uncertainty and confusion, right? So for me, um, I really think XDR is powerful because EDR was so powerful. Right. It really transformed the way we do a lot of things in the SOC, a lot yeah. of things in threat response and in, in incident response. I, I would even say it had the potential to be powerful. But but uh, you know we had to we had to enable that potential yeah. somehow, and, and that's kind of how I saw the the road to XDR right yep. it, is unlocking that full potential. Well, I think it's it's taking. I mean, it, it, EDR did so much. You needed people to do it, but I mm -hmm. think it said the the approach security specific telemetry, deep data um, important for you don't always catch things. Have the forensics do the investigation, yeah. uh, and and then you start processing that data. Say, look, if I get analytics and detection against this, I can find things earlier, yeah. and it's not just. XDR executables, it's you know, uh, evidence of, of hacking activity. XDR to me says, why aren't we doing that for more stuff? Right? Why yeah. We should be doing that for the network. We should be doing that for identity and okay. email and cloud. So it's Extending kind of, beyond Yeah, EDR. it's the same yeah. kind of construct of, of, uh, of just deep security specific telemetry. I worked a lot in, in SIM in the past, and in SIM, the problem we had was it's a, it's a data scavenger. Mm -hmm. Right, you think of Skim as an analytics tool, it's a, it's a data scavenger. The data you collect is thrown off by somebody else. It wasn't built for security. It wasn't yeah. built to detect threats. It wasn't really built for anything. It just happens to be logs that are flowing. 
EDR, you know, we built it, we could actually go in and get the telemetry. We continue to extend what we do. We just added kind of uh, the ability to get authentication events kind of coming off mm -hmm. of an endpoint, which gives us kind of visibility in the identity side. And then for us, <coughs> XDR is, is kind of bridging network and endpoint. So our, our entry into this was we took uh, some of the network technology uh, mm -hmm. that came from actually an acquisition of last line in 2020 oh, that VMware okay. made. Okay. So last line yeah, I forget was, about that. Yeah, yeah. NTA, NDR. Mm -hmm. They bought that to kind of integrate into NSX mm -hmm. and the vSphere environments. We've taken some of that tech and we've actually embedded it into the carbon black endpoint. Okay. And what that means is we now have a, an endpoint plus network kind of XDR. It's focused. Mm -hmm. We're trying to be pretty tight at what we do. So the network piece is on the on the host? Yeah. It's oh, on okay. the endpoint. So which Very means cool. we have visibility to all network connectivity throughout the environment no matter where you are. And it's not coming from the network, it's coming from the host. So if you've got your laptop in a coffee shop out here, right. we got you, right? Um, you're seeing all of the east-west traffic. Yeah. And this is interesting. This is back to that lateral movement and finding people inside most people that are doing network monitoring, it's all north-south. They're looking yeah. at egress, they're looking at what's coming in and out of my environment. They're not looking inside. Yeah. They just don't have it. You could, but it's just impractical. It's been hard, taps, devices, management's mm -hmm. been really difficult. So we now have complete visibility of east-west traffic. That data is natively married with the endpoint data. What I mean by that, it, in, in a traditional sense, if I'd caught an alert going in and out, I have to connect that. I have to say this IP address, okay, what is that? Is there a NAT between it? Is there right. DHCP tables? Okay, right. Maybe I've gotten to the right device. Now do I have EDR records? All Can the I context. See? Yeah. To get through that, back to your point around time, takes a lot of time and a lot of work yeah. to connect those things, right? And so for us, since every connection is observed on the agent, we mm -hmm. see it, we know what process was tied to it, we see right. all the rest of the activity, we know who it was, who yeah. started the process. Yeah, and pro risk process risk. tied to it. Like, that that little bit there is so important. Oh, and it's just there. Yeah. It's not that you can't get it, but it's, it takes yeah. a lot of effort to get back there and some guesswork. So for us, yeah. none of that. Um, and it's super easy to turn on. Right? So for us, if you have EDR, you want XDR, it is a feature flag on our console. There's no right. network configs. There's nothing. And boom, telemetry is coming in. You're seeing it. You're able to combine uh, with all of the deep telemetry we collect on the endpoint. Uh, use all the tools and things you're familiar with. It's just a tremendously strong offer um, that's, uh, that's making XDR approachable in our mind. I think XDR has been very hard for people because a lot of people come in and say, hey, you got to throw out everything you have. Buy yeah. all my stuff. Buy yeah, this yeah, bunch yeah. of things. Change everything you're doing. And we're saying, look, no, you're good. Mm -hmm. Keep using your SIM. You, if you're using Carbon Black, you're already there. Great. This is a way to extend and get more value, more detection, telemetry, more information. Uh, it adds to what you're already doing. And, you know. The, the X and XDR. Yeah, it yeah, just yeah. adds it. And. Yeah, and, and and the thing that gets me most excited that you said there is is I remember being engaged in the very early days, you know, when FireEye kind of uh, introduced this uh, sector, and you know we had uh, Lastline and a few other companies come in, and, and and the the way that they sold it was so counterintuitive to how you needed the technology. So when I was on the enterprise and we brought in FireEye, you know, one of the things we immediately noticed is, okay, this thing is priced as an appliance. Yeah. You know, at yeah. a point to where we can only afford to buy one and yeah. put it in our headquarters. Yeah. But that's where I have the least yep. uh, issues and yeah. in, in investigations and incidents. Yep. Like all my incidents are at these, uh, you know, these uh, stores yeah. and, and retail points where I've got three people. Yeah. I can't afford to put a quarter million dollar yeah. box in a. And you get the taps <laughs> and like network. I mean, yeah. you know, if you're not doing hairpinning now, things are going straight up the yeah. network. You're missing it. So. Um, this combination of seeing everything and back to the lateral movement, but people are in, they're moving around, yeah. you have to have visibility of what's going on. You've got to tie that, have the context of what's happening in the endpoint. Uh, we think we have something that's just really unique yeah. in market. Um, e e even a, you know, a $1,200 Palo Alto UTM was too expensive yeah. to put in a, you know, in, in a thousand locations. You ship it, you got to manage people. it, you got to yeah. keep it up, you got to upgrade it. I mean, yeah. it's, it, I think that's the practicality wise. The, yeah. the network tap based approach to this is just on manageable, it yeah. doesn't work. You yeah. can't go down it. Technically possible, but nobody yeah. does it. Yeah. Uh, we've kind of taken that, that massively distributed approach. You can do it because at each endpoint, it's not massive amount of traffic. Um, and it's just really unique insight. People are super excited. Our partners are, are kind of over the moon with this. Um, customers, people are fired up. And we're, uh, we're excited to see it out there. So is this something that existing customers, if I've already got Carbon Black uh, agents deployed, um, and it, it would be the, uh, what's the name of the, it's the detect agent? Uh, uh, it's Carbon Black Cloud uh, okay. is the, the okay. overall thing. It's, it's converged now? Yeah, 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 okay. yeah. But But is this something where I can just, uh, you know, I can switch on the licensing yeah. and, and, you know, yeah. the... 
the code is already there. I just need to switch as it up. As long as you're up on the uh, the kind of the most recent version of the of the kind of cloud agent, you've done the upgrades, which most people are, are keeping up it's on ready pretty to quick. Go. It is just a, a feature feature flag tick on, and and you're good and go. And people, it's yeah, it's hot. Very nice, very you know, low friction. Yeah. Carbon, Carbon Black has always been been uh, good about that. Like I remember in the days when they started giving out uh, licenses for free for incident responders. Uh, just yeah. ju just to get Carbon Black out there. Yeah, we still know? do it. We still do it, yeah. and it's um, the depth of what we're doing. This is so much yeah. in character of who we are, taking that deepness, uh, yeah. completeness of telemetry, and then just extending it out. We're just doing more, doing yeah. more of it, and uh, it's almost kind of getting back to our roots in, a, in yeah. some ways. Winning through product strategy. Hey, I like it. That's, I love it. Yeah, absolutely. Keep it simple. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us today, yeah. Jason. Um, to find out more about VMware Carbon Black, please visit securityweekly.com forward slash VMware Carbon Black RSAC. And if you can't stick around for the, next, for the rest of the live stream or you're catching this afterwards, you can check out securityweekly.com forward slash RSAC to find all of the RSA conference coverage by Cyber Risk Alliance. Thank you again. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. Welcome to RSA Conference 2023. It's day three. We're still in Broadcast Alley recording live, live streaming as well. I'm your host, Matt Alderman. Joining me for this segment is Mickey Bresman. He is the CEO at Sempiris. Welcome, Mickey. Thank you. Great to be here. So we're going to talk Active Directory security and I think resilience. I want to talk the security side first. So as we were preparing for this, I was going back through my notes going, wait, wait. We've had Active Directory security solutions in the market and, and some successful exits by Active Directory security vendors in the market. And I, the first question I kind of have is like, if we've had three successful exits, like, have we not solved the Active Directory security problem yet? It's a great question. I think in reality wise, we actually had much more than three. We had, from the top of my head, I can mention at least five. Okay, um, I, I knew of three because I think all three of them were sponsors at one time on, on our program, yeah. so that's why I went back. I found that, three. that makes sense, yeah. No, but yeah, there was at least five, uh, easily. Okay. But, um, so something to think about. AD has been around since roughly 2000, mm -hmm. maybe 99 is how many people look at it, uh, which give, makes it today 23 years old type of a technology, which means that it have a lot of different vulnerabilities that were created by different administrators that were managing it and using it and so on. The startups that you've mentioned that had the exits, or the companies should probably say, were all solving different type of problems. Mm -hmm. um, and the reality is that there are still a lot of different problems with AD. What we've seen in, if you go by whatever you, whoever you prefer to quote, if it's uh, Microsoft security research, if it's uh, the Verizon one, everybody basically uh, quoting nine out of 10 attacks will have AD because it's such an interesting target. Hmm. Now also, another thing to keep in mind, AD is in use by 90% of the companies out there. So now as this is, forget the market size for me, as an attacker, I know you have one. If I want to go and breach your Salesforce as an example, I will not try to breach your Salesforce. I will go after your AD. There is plenty of solutions, probably should not call those solutions, but plenty of tools out there that can allow you to abuse AD that were hmm. created over, the, over all right. of those years. Yep. So you can buy tools to abuse AD for relatively non-expensive uh, pricing, uh, as, as, as funny as it might sound, or not funny. Um, and since I know that once I get inside of AD, I own everything, right. you have a lot of people that are putting a lot of effort to create those tools that allows you to abuse AD. And I think that's part of the reason why we keep on seeing new and new types of attacks coming up all the time. And it's part of the reason why the problem has not been solved. So why hasn't Microsoft fixed this? You've got Azure AD, you've got all, Microsoft making lots of investments in, in innovation on the security side, but yet they haven't tackled the security aspects of Active Directory. Don't they have an opportunity to do it? Like, why haven't they done it? First, I'm going to start by saying that they love Microsoft. Um, and, and we all use them, right? Yeah, we but, all do. But I think, if you think about what the size of the problem actually is, and, and what is it that any one company can do? One of the things that I always say in security in general, no one company will solve everything, at least not in the feasible future. I know that some inspired to that, but, um, and generally speaking, Microsoft's approach was always that they like the ecosystem. So they want to make sure that there are partners that are working with them, and we're one of those, and, and creating solutions around the products that they provide into the market. With that said, I think Microsoft did a lot on the security side 
uh, more so in Azure AD now than right. in AD. Yeah. I've kind of made the push of we want to make sure that once you get into the cloud, which is typically more vulnerable because it's more exposed, right. we want to make sure that you feel very safe there. So to some degree, I would say that AD on-prem is now more of a focus of, of third-party providers Got it. like ourselves. Okay. So Azure AD does have some more of the security protections mm -hmm. in it versus the old legacy on-prem mm -hmm. Active Directory, right? Correct. Okay. So are you protecting? We'll get into the uh, what you're doing actually in a second, but so are you just primarily focused then on the on-prem Active Directory environments or do you, does your solution also kind of overlap into so Azure AD? We, so we actually do both. We do AD on-prem and Azure AD. Um, and I think maybe what is more interesting is the hybrid scenarios now that we're seeing. Because mm -hmm. both directions, by the way, so both I've breached something in the, like your AD on-prem environment, I have an account, that account is being synchronized into your Azure AD because let's be real, most companies there out there are hybrid and they're all synchronized yep. accounts. Some synchronized secrets as well, password mostly. Mm -hmm. um, so once I've been synchronized into your Azure AD environment, potentially now I, I also become a global admin account or something like that. I get privileges and boom, I'm going inside of, in, into your Salesforce. And we also see some of the attacks that go the other way around. I've breached Azure AD, from there I go back to your on-prem environment and I own both environments. Right, okay. Um, so it's also interesting to watch kind of the evolution of what is happening in the, I'm going to call it the market, but you had for years attackers focusing on AD because that was like the number one target. If you think about the amount of time that Azure AD has been around, it's roughly if we were now in 2012 from AD on-prem perspective, why I'm bringing it up, 2012, we had attacks against AD, but it wasn't a lot of those as what we see now. Right. Okay. My point is that this is to some degree also the tipping point. So, and things now move much, much, much faster than what they mm -hmm. used to be 10 years ago. Right. So what we are starting to see is attacks going specifically after Azure AD, because all of a sudden it's a much more interesting target. Because right. if I get there, I get into your cloud applications, right. which are also a much more interesting target as time goes by. Because and, and you're putting more and more sensitive exactly. data and your crown jewels in the cloud, so go there first tap into those, oh, by the way, I can get synchronized on-prem, I can go after all your on-prem assets later too if I wanted to, right? Correct. So we still see much more attacks going against AD on-prem, but with that said, we're starting to see a, an uptick in attacks going against Azure AD. Got and it. by the way, others as well. I mean, Okta has been breached, as you probably mm -hmm. know. Yeah. Um, anything that, that can be interesting will be a target. Yeah, I mean, credentials, getting to act, I mean, that's the first step, right? You, you get credentials, get those credentials in the environment, escalate privileges, and then move pretty much wherever you want. Like, it's the common case, that's, right? That's why they call those the, the keys to the kingdom, right? Right, yeah. You get those, you, you can do, by the way, two different aspects. One, potentially as an attacker, I'm going after because I want to steal the data. Mm -hmm. So I want the permissions to go and enter whatever system and, and right. take whatever one. The second one is the ransomware or the wiper situation. Wiper basically means I don't want your money. I just right. want to destroy yeah, you. Yeah, I want to destroy you, yeah. And if I take down your permission provider, you can't do anything because you can't log into anything. No data, nothing can authenticate mm. you. So you're basically completely locked out. And unfortunately in ransomware attacks, if you remember the Maersk story is an example. Yeah. Nine day just to recover their AD. Now keep in mind that while AD is down, you cannot recover anything else because everything depends on AD. Right. So. If I can get inside of your AD or Azure AD for the sake of the discussion, I own your environment. Yeah, okay, interesting. So, you said each of these companies, these five different initial startups, are all kind of solving a different security problem. Yep. How are you solving the Active Directory security problem? Like, what's unique about your approach that maybe the other five haven't done? Sure. So I think, first of all, the way that we approach it, we refer to that as the cyber resiliency challenge. Okay. And when I'm thinking about cyber resiliency, to me, it basically means I want to cover the entire attack kill chain. I want to think about what do I do to prevent it, mm. so the pre-attack stage. Yep. I want to think how fast can I detect it and then contain it, so this is the during the attack stage. But also, I'm being realistic and I know that at some point, things will fail to potentially be a human mistake. There is multiple different reasons why. So I want to be able to help with, to, with a customer, even in a situation where they've been maybe encrypted end to end, kind of the, the late stage of the attack. Mm -hmm. Or the, the other scenario that we see quite often is that I as an attacker now own the environment as we, as we spoke about it before. Um, what do you do then? Right. And we are the most complete solution in the market today 
where we basically provide the pre, the during, and the post, everything under the same platform, everything plays Got it. nicely together. Um, on the resiliency, and that's to me what basically what's the resiliency side is. On the resiliency side, the last stage when it comes to the, you've been breached, and I'll give you maybe a story so that, to give you some understanding of what it means. We get a call from um, a customer that was not a customer of ours before the incident. They had um, their AD environment breached. In their case, the firewalls were dedicated against AD as well. Mm. They come into the, in the, to the office one morning and they find out everything is completely open, no rules on the firewall, traffic as you can imagine in and out, that attacker can do right. whatever they want. Yep. They go in, they change all of the passwords, close all the, the firewalls and so on. Yay, get, gain control of the environment. Next morning, the exact same thing happens again. Everything is open, so they understand, okay, we don't control this environment at all. There is something in our AD that owns this environment. Yep. So in most cases, unless you have a resiliency program in plan, in place, you're lost. So basically what you're saying is, I needed a known good state that I could roll back to. So this is where the challenge actually becomes. You're right, but. Okay. The challenge of trying to figure out what is a good known state is almost impossible to solve. Mm. The reason being, most likely you've been breached months ago. The attacker was inside of your environment for God knows how long. You cannot really go back months ago because the amount of data that you will lose because of it is something that you will not survive as an organization. So we took a completely different approach. Okay. We said, let's decouple AD from Windows, the operating system on which it is running, so that any malware that have been deployed, any rootkits and so on, once we back up the environment, if we recover to a clean OS, we are not bringing none of that with us. Just no executables at all, making sure that that's not traveling with oh, us. Oh, interesting. Then we said another challenge that we've seen with ransomware attacks, maybe the environment does not exist anymore at all. Hmm. So maybe I was running even a hardware uh, type of, of yeah. machines. Um, by the way, it's, it's highly recommended by Microsoft. So maybe I had HP, Dell, any one of those machines running my DCs. Everything has been encrypted, firmware type of an attack. I lost the environment completely. I need to move to Azure or something like that, or AWS or GCP, any one of the cloud providers. The challenge in the past was that you had infrastructure dependency. So you could not take a backup from here to there. Right. We eliminated it completely. We're agnostic to the infrastructure. You took a backup of whatever that machine was. You created it wherever you want. We change IP addresses on the fly. So generally speaking, we basically solve the challenge of what happens in those scenarios where we lost control completely. Literally, three clicks, you are done. You're saying, I used to be here, that's no longer relevant, I'm going there, I used to have 50 DCs, I only have five now, do your thing. The machine, that, the, the system basically does the whole thing. Oh. And also, what we also found out is most customers actually want the human interaction as well because you want somebody that's been there, right, done right. that, yeah, yeah. and seen. So we have an incident response team that is focused specifically on the, on the identity side of things. And we're seeing on average one or two incidents a month. Now keep in mind, incident for me is not, you have a mailbox. It's not full-blown ransomware, per no, se. No, it actually is. For oh, it me, is. an incident is not, you will, company will not be calling me because they have a mailbox okay. that have been breached. Or, right. or they call me because it's the end. Okay. Like, either they fully lost control of the environment or it's been encrypted. So because we're seeing those type of situation on a monthly basis, when we come in, we have playbooks, we know exactly what to do. First thing, don't panic. There is ways to deal with it. It's not the end of the world. And we basically start to work with the customer from that point, getting back the control of the environment, recovering if needed, forensic that comes after that, making sure the attacker is really, really out. Got it. And then you're putting the resilience component in place so that it doesn't happen again. Correct. So then we, we try to do as much as we can on the prevention, because if we can, let's make sure that right. we don't even get so, there. So what are the types of prevention controls that you can actually put in place with Active Directory? Multiples. So we have, on the pre-attack stage, I would say indicators of exposure, indicators of compromise. Those okay. are the things that you would mostly be focusing on. We have about 150 of those between AD and Azure AD, and also some that go specifically for the hybrid scenarios. Um, everything that we find will be mapped to the MITER or uh, attack or defend frameworks. We also provide the ANSI framework just because we have different type of requirements from customers. And then we also allow you to understand how bad it is what we find. The idea there is that once we found a, a something that it can be potentially lead to a breach in your environment, yeah. close the gap as fast as you can before the attacker actually does it. So if you remember the summer of 2021, there were about three zero days coming out of Microsoft one after the other. Petit Pitam was the one that mostly discussed, but there were actually two other ones that were as bad. Um, 
What we did on our security research team, we released indicators every three days. So once the, the, there was a discovery of what it is, how it's operate, three days after you as, as a customer got an indicator, you knew where you have the vulnerabilities, mm -hmm. you went ahead and you closed the gaps. Yep. So that would be one thing that you can do to prevent, just scan your environment and make sure that you close the gaps before somebody finds them. Right. The second thing, you can actually harden your environment to some degree. You can set up policies in place. Many companies will deploy a PAM, like Delenia, CyberArk, there is yep. multiple of those. But you need to make sure that you actually enforce the usage of those. Because what happens with many of, of the PAM solutions is that if now somebody does something that has nothing to do with the PAM, but it is a privileged account in the AD environment, the PAM will not know about it. Or will know about it 10, 10 hours later, which is way too late. Yeah, way too late. So if, if you use a solution that can let you know what changes are taking place, who is making those, what values are they changing, what objects are they touching, and then also prevent it if it's not supposed to be happening. A change happened, it's not in line with our policy, undo it immediately, don't keep it there. That's some, some of the things you can do to prevent things. Awesome. Mickey, this has been enlightening. I didn't know we still had a big Active Directory security problem. Thank you for joining us. It was great. Thank you. If you want to learn more about how to protect your Active Directory environment, please visit securityweekly.com forward slash Sempiris RSAC. Sempiris RSAC. Good afternoon, everybody, from day, what is this, three? Day three. I think three. Day three of RSA 2023. I am pleased to be joined by Dave Merkel, CEO and co-founder of Expel, which is also the sponsor of this segment. Welcome. Oh, thank you. I like the uh, Merkel, which is the proper pronunciation as opposed to Merkel. So that's nice. Well done. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, I figure you got you get that a lot. That's um, yeah. I think the best thing I got was going through an airport in Frankfurt, and the guard was like, "How are things in Berlin?" And I was like, "What?" And he's like, "Your last name," which was hilarious. <laughs> yeah, very slyly. Your it, last name. Like subtle German humor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so sh shifting subjects to the uh, matter at hand. Oh, okay. The matter at hand for us right now is. Um, vulnerability and threat landscape okay. and how it is changing okay. in the world for your customers. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, nice small topic. Um, I'll, I'll take that in just two, two parts. If I think about um, a sort of threat landscape, I hate that phrase, but it's in use, so let's go with it. Um, like thought leadership. Yeah, the, the, when, when we look at... Uh, yeah, exactly. I don't like it, but I, I haven't yeah. thought of anything better. This thought is out front. Um, when I think about uh, evolving threats, I mean, it, it evolves with the, with the technology, right? So um, as defenders become more adept, attackers become faster. Um, that is exacerbated as there's new attack surfaces. You know, think about cloud. Mm -hmm. uh, think past cloud and sort of the nuances inside cloud environments like Kubernetes. Uh, and so, um, so, so there's that continual adaptation. That's a forever thing. That's not new, but right. but that's um, that's a continued evolution. As I think about something like vulnerability management, um, that's been historically thought about as in the context of well, we do some scans and we got some vulnerabilities, and then we'll take six months and maybe somebody will patch some stuff, and who knows. Um, I think as we look to the future, you really have to think about operationalizing that. There's a set of that information that you really need to act on in the same time frame as you would an alert. If you want to actually minimize risk, if you go back to what I originally said about threats, which mm -hmm. is as we evolve, they get faster. And so as time matters, you know, your cycle time is material as to whether or not your controls, your mitigations actually have an effect. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think the need to up our operational game uh, is a, a continual arena of development to include in areas that historically have not thought that way, like vulnerability management. So, um, how long has Expel been around? Uh, let's see, we were founded in 2016, mm -hmm. uh, and then we first came to market with sort of 1.0 of Expel at the beginning of 2018. So we've been in uh, existence almost seven years, uh, in market uh, just over five. And how does Expel help um, remedy the landscape as you've just described it. Sure, sure. So uh, if we think about the threat side of things, which is where Expel was born, uh, is focused on sort of managed detection and response, but we use a technology-centric approach as opposed to just people. Mm -hmm. uh, a few things. One is um, we've really focused our technology and our process around dropping those cycle times from alert to fix. 
So uh, alert to fix in a few days, unacceptable. A few hours, unacceptable, you've mm -hmm. got minutes. And so, uh, so that's one arena is true operational excellence driven by technology to get those kinds of outcomes. Uh, it's providing capabilities around new attack surfaces as they evolve, so not just traditional sort of domain of MDR, but actual cloud proficiency, whether mm -hmm. you're talking cloud platforms, whether you're talking SaaS applications, uh, that's where your stuff is, and so your detection and response protection umbrella should extend across all of your assets. Uh, you have to then adopt, you know, every time Amazon changes how cloud works at every reInvent, you've got to be there, whether we're talking Lambda, whether we're talking Kubernetes, mm -hmm. uh, and so that's another domain. And then lastly, I'll say, um, on the threat side of things, we've uh, really focused on being able to operationalize all the things our customers have invested in. And so, I think we integrate with over 115 different technologies today across all those domains, sort of traditional security, cloud platform, cloud SaaS, et cetera. Uh, and we're producing new ones every single day because that's, that's the landscape. Like, go walk the show floor at RSA. I haven't seen the logos out there or the types of products decrease in the entire time I've been coming here and I've been doing this stuff for over a you know, quarter century because I'm old. Uh, and so I think that's necessary. On the, on the vulnerability side of things, we can talk more about this. Uh, we actually just announced this week, we're bringing out an offering that we call vulnerability prioritization, which is really taking that stuff you've invested in for vulnerability management, integrating with it, and making it operational. Like, what do you need to get to right now? What do you need to get to at speed? How do you use that data in real time in your detection and response efforts? Uh, so we're trying to make sure that we provide sort of full spectrum coverage across the entire attack cycle. So let's go a little more granular with that. Sure. Um, so, expel vulnerability prioritization, um, how, go into some specifics of yeah. how it helps customers evaluate their risks. Yeah, so there's a few arena, arenas where that's going to help. First is that prioritization, but not just prioritization in the context of some scoring assigned by some external entity, because if you buy prioritization, you've already bought some aspect of our core offering, we can actually look at your operational environment because we're connected to it. We've got your EDR, we've got your SIM, we've got your network, we've got your cloud mm -hmm. platform. And so we can marry up that operational knowledge with what your vulnerability management infrastructure is telling us to give you a crisper picture on, no, 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 these six things. I know there's 40 on this list, these six right now and here's why. And so that really gives you a crisper picture that is more actionable and results in actual reduced risk and we can prove it. So that's one arena where, where we're significantly helping. Mm -hmm. Another arena where we're helping is we may be able to tell you about some things before your vulnerability management infrastructure tells you because of our defense community, our other customers that we're connected to. And so we may be able to help you cover blind spots faster. Uh, and then lastly, we are doing your core detection and response we take all that vuln information, we put it in that process, and say there's an incident against a key asset, we know if it's got core vulnerabilities, if there's other assets in its proximity that are now more vulnerable to attack because they've got vulnerabilities, like say, say there's some particular configuration or vulnerability that makes lateral movement easier. We can tell you, not only should you worry about this asset, but the likelihood an attacker is going to start moving on you is vastly increased because of these problems. And so we can make that data operationally useful, and we do that for you. Very good. Now, you mentioned how long you've been doing this. Yeah. And it's about the same time I've been doing this. Uh, there you go. High five. And vulnerability management is one of those topics where... Companies are always behind. Yeah, um, and I loved that you were getting, you were talking about how this helps with prioritization. Yeah, because that over the years has been one of the recurring problems. That's exactly right. People have talked about so, but in a general sense, as you look over the last twenty plus years, mm -hmm. are organizations getting better? at this or are we are we doomed to just be on this circular whack-a-mole merry-go-round uh let's see here so i have to fight my, my my last name is miracle but my mom's name is mclaughlin so i'm irish i will now f fight my irish nature which is highly pessimistic um so so do i see improvement yeah i do um it does sometimes regress like as you have a new attack surface like take 
again, we'll go back to cloud or, or sort of subsets of, of what sits in your cloud like Kubernetes, that then kind of resets your capabilities a little bit. So maybe you've taken a few steps forward, but now kind of the thing you're protecting changed shape. And now, you know, record scratch and you back up a couple steps. And so, yeah, there's some of that that's always, I think, going to occur. Uh, I think some of the biggest places where we've moved the needle really are sort of levels of awareness in the business. Having board level conversations, maybe not about all the crunchy details, but you know, some smarter questions, uh, some, some more pressure on business priorities, that I think is actually significantly approved over the long arc of time. Uh, and I do see us um, moving the needle uh, on some of these uh, you know, sort of long-standing issues like vulnerability management. Um, is there still a long way to go? Yeah, because progress is slow. It is. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but I have a, probably a more optimistic view uh, that uh, particularly because the attacker, I mean, the, the kind of extension of attack activity, because that's not going away, it's increasing every year. I don't mean that through like to, to spread fear, it's just true, mm -hmm. drives improvement. You don't have a choice. It's a survival thing. It's not a theoretical thing. If we go back to, you know, kind of the mid kind of aughts, some of that was a little bit more theoretical. Yeah, you should, but there weren't nearly as many headlines. And so I think that pressure forces evolution. Uh, and so, and so I'm, I'm, I'm net positive, but I acknowledge the fact that sometimes it can be hard to see the progress. All we can do is just keep doing the best we can. I, well, the alternative is give up. That doesn't yep. seem like a good idea. And we're all still here. Yep. I mean, so are the bad guys. That's not going to change. But, but we're here. Uh, this, this, this video appears to be working like the sound system worked. Like, so <laughs> that didn't get disrupted. So, so, so I think the, that getting overly pessim pessimistic, pessimistic, wow, that word is hard. That was yesterday, actually. Yeah. Was that yesterday was pessimistic? No, the, uh, the, the power and internet going on the blink. Oh, did it? At least in this little quarter of the universe. That wasn't me, <laughs> as, as far as you know. <laughs> so it's been a pleasure catching up with you. And uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. Fantastic. You too. And uh, the same to all of you. Hope you're enjoying the show or enjoying whatever you're doing, wherever you are.